Greetings again, friends and brethren around the world. I ask the question this night is the Christmas night according to the new Gregorian calendar celebrated by the Western world. The question is, is Christmas pagan? I'm not going to give you any definite answer, yes or no. I'm just going to present you the facts from the reliable sources written in the Anglo-Saxon world. And all of you, each one of you for yourself, need to determine, based on the facts, whether the answer is yes or no. Well, we can start with the famous Merry Christmas greetings. You see, all the Merry Christmas is such a common greeting during the winter festival season, little do people realize what is the true meaning of those words. The customs and traditions of Christmas originate from pagan witchcraft. Does the word Christmas mean the birth of Christ? Not at all. It actually means death of Christ as clearly stated in several references. Here they are. Here is the first quote from World Book Encyclopedia, Volume 3, page 408, 1986 edition, World Book Incorporation, Chicago, Illinois. Here is the first quote. The word Christmas comes from Christes Maese, an early English phrase that means Mass of Christ. Now, the word Mass, that was the end of the quote, and the word Mass, by the way, is used only in the Roman Catholic system. Christ Mass, or Christ Mass, is a Roman Catholic term as well. Therefore, Merry Christmas literally means Merry Death of Christ. That was the first source. Here is another source from your Anglo-Saxon world by C. D. C. Uh, sorry, R. C. Broderick, Nihil Obstad, and Richard uh, J. Skelba. It is from the Catholic Encyclopedia. This is from 1975 edition. Here is the quote. In the Christian law, the supreme sacrifice is that of the Mass. The supreme act of worship consists essentially in an offering of a worthy victim to God, the offering made by a proper person as a priest, the destruction of the victim. End of the quote. Now, the Latin word for victim is well-known word, you know, today, hostia. And we see that mass implies a sacrifice where a victim is involved. Here is now the third source. It is the book entitled The Mass in Slow Motion. It was written by Ronald Knox and it was published in New York in 1948 by Sheet and Ward Incorporation. And this book, so The Mass in Slow Motion, Ronald Knox, New York 1948. This is the quote from page 110. It is only with the consecration that the sacrifice of the mass is achieved. I have represented the mass to you more than once as a kind of ritual dance. End of the quote. So the mass essentially represents the ceremonial slaying of Christ every Sunday. It is actually the death sacrifice in which Hostia is the victim. Well, now, is there anything merry about the suffering and the death of Christ? You see, dear friends, Satan has succeeded in deceiving many people so that they are not aware of such a blasphemy. It is possible indeed to prove, based on the biblical record, that December 25th is not the day on which Christ was born. And I'll give a separate audio message on that. Was Christ, why is, is it that Christ was not born on December 25th? And Christmas actually stems from paganism. It is a witch's Sabbath called Yule. Now, let's read some more sources that speak about the origin of Christmas. Here is another source. So again, I'm quoting all this from the Anglo-Saxon sources, which are very relevant, written by uh, proven authorities. This is from the book Early Church History to A.D. 313 by Henry Melville Watkin. It was published by Macmillan in 1912 and original from the University of Michigan. Digit it was digitized on November 13, 2008 and this is from the page 140. So this is what this page says. Mithra came to the front in the 3rd century. There was a true moral element in the worship of Mithra, the all-seeing, the author and protector of life, Mithra the purifier, the giver of immortality. 
a great Catholic church of Mithra overspread the land from Persia to Britain, especially along the great rivers where the legions lay. It had regular and irregular clergy, ascetics and mendicant friars, and diverse orders of faithful men. It had regular divine service three times daily and a yearly round of festivals culminating in the birthday of Mitra, December 25th, with meetings for worship and processions of noisy votaries. So this is from Early Church History to AD 313 by Henry Melville Watkin. Now let's read about Christmas from the new Schaff Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge. In that uh, encyclopedia, you're indeed going to find an article called Christmas. And here is what it says about that celebration. Quote, How much the date of the festival depended upon the pagan Brumalia, December 25th, following the Saturnalia, December 17th to 24th, and celebrating the shortest day of the year and the new sun cannot be accurately determined. The pagan Saturnalia and Brumalia were too deeply entrenched in popular custom to be set aside by Christian influence. The pagan festival with its riot and merrymaking was so popular that Christians were glad of an excuse to continue its celebration with little change in spirit and in manner. Christians, Christian preachers, that is, of the West and the Near East, protested against the unseemly frivolity with which Christ's birthday was celebrated while Christians of Mesopotamia accused their Western brethren of idolatry and sun worship for adopting as Christian this pagan festival. End of the quote. Now also, you know, when you consider the Bible, when Christ was born in Judea, we read in Luke chapter 2 verse 8 that there was, there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, if you read Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 11, and the book of Ezra, chapter 10, verses 10 and 13, we can see that winter is a rainy season in Judea. And so says the Adam Clark's commentary. Here is the quote from Adam Clark. It was an ancient custom among Jews of those days to send out their sheep to the fields and deserts about the Passover, early spring, and bring them home at commencements of the first rain. During this time they were out. The shepherds watched them night and day. As the first rain began early in the month of Marcheshwan, which answers to part of our October and November, we find that the sheep were kept out in the open country during the whole summer. And as these shepherds had not yet brought home their flocks, so on this very ground, says Adam Clark, the nativity in December should be given up. End of the quote. And now I'm reading now from some of my notes. I've made a compilation and notes about uh, the origin of Christmas. And as I told you in the shorter message, it all began at the Tower of Babel, about 2,200 years before the birth of our Messiah. Again, the first despot, the first world dictator was Nimrod, the grandson of Noah, and he is the one who started a cult with his mother wife Semiramis where they offered up babies in a child mass on altars to Moloch or Satan at the winter solstice. As you might remember, in the first five books of Moses in the Bible, uh, they're also called Pentateuch, you may find there are strict prohibition against sacrificing your offspring to Moloch or Baal, or Sun God, or basically Satan. And, you know, for each of the 12 months in the coming new year, there were 12 days of blood sacrifices that were meant to give the Sun God the life force from these innocent children. By December 25th, they declared that the Sun God had come back to life and called it the rebirth of the sun. Now, as I also mentioned in the shorter message, when Nimrod was later executed for his crimes against children, his wife, mother, became pregnant, and she concocted a story in order to keep this pagan religion alive in Babylon. Now, we're speaking about the ancient Babylon, the one that was ruled by Nimrod and Semiramis. There was later another Babylon ruled by Nebuchadnezzar, who is mentioned, of course, in the Bible. So, this ancient Babylon, the original Babylon, is where the cult of Semiramis and Nimrod began, and the origin of Christmas. You see, the roots 
of Christmas all stem from that ancient Babylon. So the Semiramis told the Babylonians that Nimrod had impregnated her by the rays of the sun on March 25th, which is the vernal equinox, or Easter Sunday. Exactly nine months later, on December 25th, Semiramis gave birth to another son, and she named him Tammuz. We can read in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14, how angry God was with the house of Judah for worshipping Tammuz. Now, of course, Tammuz was also worshipped by the uh, ten tribes of Israel, uh, which apostated from the true religion, and as the consequences, they were scattered all over the place. Now, Semiramis then told the Babylonians that Nimrod had been reincarnated or reborn on December 25th through the through her newborn son Tammuz, and that he was the god of the sun, and she was the goddess of the moon. She continued to practice child sacrifices on the vernal equinox in remembrance of the time when she first conceived Tammuz, and she taught the Babylonians to dye eggs in the blood of these infants. How blasphemous, my dear friends. Now, Semiramis was renamed Ishtar, or Easter, in other cultures, because according to mythology, she rises or resurrects in the East every spring on the vernal equinox, from the underworld. This is why you see the pagans continue to sacrifice infants to her on Easter Sunday. It is because the sun rises in the east and she is married to the sun god. Now here is also a summary from a book entitled The Mysteries of Mithra. It was published in 1903 and its author is Franz Cumont. C-U-M-O-N-T. So, this is a summary now that I have based on Franz Cumont's The Mystery of Mithra. Mithra, this author says, was born of a virgin in a stable on the winter solstice, frequently December 25th in the Julian calendar. The Roman Emperor Aurelian declared December 25th to be the official birthday of Mithra, circa 270 Christ era. So, in the Julian calendar, you know, it was attended by shepherds who brought gifts, worshipped on Sundays, shown with a nimbus or halo around his head, said to take a last supper with his followers when he returned to his father, believed, this is the god Midra, we're speaking about, about this god Mitra, this is not about Jesus Christ, by the way, believed not to have died, but to have ascended to heaven, whence it was believed he would return at the end of the time, to raise the dead in a physical resurrection for a final judgment, sending the good to heaven and the wicked to hell, after the world had been destroyed by fire, to grant his followers immortal life following baptism. This is all about Mithra. So this is a pagan god which was worshipped in Persia and in the Near East. As far as the followers of Mithra are concerned, they followed a leader called a Papa, or Pope, who ruled from the Vatican, Hill in Rome. They celebrated the atoning death of a Savior who res has resurrected on a Sunday. They celebrated sacraments, a consecrated meal of bread and wine, termed a Mazda, corresponding exactly to the Catholic Misa, or Mass, using chanting, bells, candles, incense, and holy water in remembrance of the Last Supper of Mithra. Now, the Emperor Constantine the Great, who was born in Serbia, in the city of Nish, he was a follower of Mithra until he declared December 25th the official birthday of Jesus in, 13, in 313 Christ era. So this is a summary based on Franz Cumont's The Mystery of Mithra, published in 1903. Now, as far as the Emperor Constantine, I have much to say about him because he was born in my country. And uh, there are, uh, on my YouTube channel, you may find uh, some information about him and how he blended, or polluted rather, the true Christianity with paganism, because he was the man who held the title Pontifex Maximus, which was the title of the pagan high priest, until the very, very end of his life. And that title, Pontifex Maximus, was succeeded, he was succeeded with the title by the Roman clergy, namely by the Roman pontiff, by the head of the Roman church. So all the popes following the death of Emperor Constantine until today also hold the same title, Pontifex Maximus. Now the original name of Rome was Saturnia, the city of Saturn. 
Saturnalia was a great feast celebrated from December 17 all the way to December 4, 24. And Romans believed that the winter sun was slowly dying because it was seen rising further and further to the south each morning. By December 25th it was coming back north and it was said it to be reborn on this day called Brumalia. And during this pagan festival the city of Rome was covered with drunken people and orgies were taking place everywhere with ivy, ribbons, wreaths, etc., that pagan festival of the winter solstice called Saturnalia is now actually called Christmas. Now, Mithraism was the largest pagan religion in the Roman and Greek world. The Mithraists, they kept the winter festival uh, called the Nativity of the Sun. So they believed that the sun was born each year on December 25th and Constantine, as I said, the Pontifex Maximus, high priest of Mithraism, blended Christianity and Mithraism and what we have today in Europe is actually a Constantinian, we might call it Constantinian Christianity. Christianity, which is not the original Christianity of Jesus Christ and his apostles, not at all. It is the blend, as I mentioned, of Christianity and Mithraism. Here is a quote from Collier's Encyclopedia, so another authoritative source for all of you to uh, consider. Here is the quote speaking about uh, triumph of Constantine and the Rome. After the triumph of Constantine, it says, The church at Rome assigned December 25th as the date for the celebration of the feast, Messiah's birth, possibly about 320 AD or 353 AD. By the end of the 4th century, the whole Christian world was celebrating Christmas on that day. The choice of December 25th was probably influenced by the fact that on this day the Romans celebrated the Mithraic feast of their sun god Mithra and that Saturnalia also came at this time. End of the quote. This is a, was a quote from Collier's Encyclopedia. So, you know, what should we conclude? Well, Christmas obviously is not a Christian holiday. And Jesus Christ was not born on December 25th because Luke chapter 2 verse 8 stated, as we read, that at the birth of Messiah, the shepherds were in the field. Now this, as Adam Clark explains to us, could not be on December 25th. And the Catholic Encyclopedia says the following, quote, Christmas was not among the earliest festivals of the church. End of the quote. So it did not start to be observed at the birth, as the birth of Messiah until late 4th century by the Catholic Church who had taken over by the true church by this time and of course all of this so called Christianity, Constantine's Christianity was sanctioned in the 4th century with the, you know, under the leadership and blessing and uh, <laughs> I should rather say coercion of Constantine the Great who of course persecuted the original true faith the original apostolic faith, and instituted a blend, a strange blend of Mithraism and Christianity. Now, since John's mother, John, John the Baptist's mother Elizabeth, was in her sixth month of pregnancy when Jesus was conceived, and we can see that in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verse 24 through 36, so since she was in her sixth month of pregnancy, Jesus was conceived then, we can thus determine the approximate time of year Jesus uh, was born, if we know when John was born. And I'll give another message about that. But, you know, let's, let's say this much. John's father, Zechariah, was a high priest serving in the Jerusalem temple during the course of Abijah, which we can find in Luke chapter 1 verse 5. Historical calculations indicate that this course of service corresponded to June 13 through June 19 in that year. This explanation you'll find, dear friends, in the Companion Bible published in 1974. You'll find it in Appendix 179 on page 200. Again, I'm just reading your sources, the Anglo-Saxon sources, authoritative sources, and not to mention that the, uh, the the greatest authority that I've read and quoted from is the Holy Scriptures. 
And based on the Holy Scriptures, I'll give another message on why Christ was not born in December. There is no way. And it was during this time of temple service that Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, he learned that he and his wife, Elizabeth, would have a child. You can read about that in Luke chapter 1, verse 8 through 13. And after he completed his service and traveled home, Elizabeth conceived. You can find it again in Luke chapter 1, verse 23 and 24. And assuming John's conception took place near the end of June, adding nine months brings us to the end of March as the most likely time for John the Baptist's birth. Adding another six months, of course, which is the difference in ages between John and Jesus. The difference of ages is six months, as you can find in Luke chapter 1, verse 35 and 36. That brings us to the end of September, beginning of October, as the likely time of the birth of Jesus Christ. So simple, so amazing, and so authoritative as it is revealed in the Holy Scriptures. And men might like their, you know, pagan customs, and they might say, think that the, the, the festivity season is so great and wonderful and marvelous. And no, we don't celebrate any paganism, we celebrate Jesus Christ. Well, how can you celebrate Jesus Christ and his birth on the date when he was not born? That's absurd. Does that make any sense? Many people think wrongly that they are, you know, celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, when in fact, they are not. He was not born on December 25th. As simple as that. And just as all the roads lead to Rome, so all modern Christian, so-called Christian worship actually, goes to the sun god Mithra, Baal or Nimrod, my dear friends. The source is all one and the same, of course, Satan the devil. The modern sun worship is an idolatrous system which forms the mark of the beast, if you wish. Because what is the mark of the beast? It's the idolatry. For what is, you know, for what is Christmas but a sun worship as well as Easter and New Year's Eve? And you see, all that idolatry goes contrary to God, the Creator, since pagans celebrated and worshipped Sun, the Creator. And that is why Sunday comes forth as the main thrust in modern sun worshipping idolatry and will be embedded indeed in the European law just as it, had, it was at the time of Emperor Constantine the Great Pagan, as I called him, <laughs> Constantine the Great Pagan, who was Mithra worshipper. He was Mithra's worshipper. He was the worshipper of sun god. So he was, until the very end of his life, the sun god worshipper. And there are plenty of evidence I've gathered from uh, both Eastern sources and Western sources, from historians who are of Russian descent, historians who are of German descent, historians who are, who are of Italian descent, historians who are of Serbian descent. We're speaking of the so-called first Christian Roman emperor. Brethren, friends, he was not a Christian at all. And I've got plenty to say about that. I've gathered again the evidence, historical evidence from East and West, both East and West. And all, even though I've already presented some of those things to, you know, to greater public in my, uh, some of my uh, lectures on my YouTube channel, I think that that was not the final word. But the evidence is abundant that Constantine was never truly converted to Christianity and the evidence is also abundant that he was the one who imposed his blend of Mithraism and Christianity onto Europe and by extension onto the world. So what we have today, which is called Christianity, is really a Constantine version of Christianity. And again, as I have said many already several times, and I, as I have said many times up to now, it is a blend of Mithraism, pagan Mithraism, and Christianity, and true Christianity. There is no purity in it. You see, also in the Northern Hemisphere, the red and white halluc hallucinogenic mushroom would grow out of Reindeer droppings. You see, this mushroom was used in pagan ceremonies and is associated with the occult and ancient mystery schools and gnosis that would lift men from the earth and to the heavens and give gifts of knowledge and understanding. 
And you see the symbolism of Santa in red and white, wearing the Phrygian cap, being pulled through the heavens and following behind the reindeer, clearly depicts this. Now think, you know, that is why so many get mushy at Christmas. Now Nimrod, he was the grandfather of paganism, as I already mentioned the, that figure. Now clearly Christmas, as the observance of the Savior's birth, did not come into existence immediately. It was not observed for at least three centuries after his birth. But you see, Christmas as a pagan holiday traces back thousands of years to a man named Nimrod indeed, who is the founder of ancient pagan Babylon. And forefather to Mithras, Nimrod began a counterfeit religion in the book of Genesis that was to compete with the true faith of the Bible in every conceivable way down through the centuries. The Bible refers to it as the religion of mystery of Babylon, the mother of false religion that will be destroyed when the Savior Jesus comes to set up his throne on this earth. And he calls the father, the Bible refers, calls this religion of Nimrod and this modern Constantine Christianity. He calls it mystery religion in Revelation chapter 18, where we have the prophecy about that whole system being smashed and destroyed by the return of Jesus Christ. So Babylon's false worship is found today in some aspect in nearly all religions, all religions, not excluding the modern Christianity. There's also this, you know, uh, theme of the Madonna and child. Now that theme, which is universal and evident in hundreds of religious religions that is down through the centuries, had its origin, of course, in Babylon. Nimrod was so full of evil, it is said that he married his own mother, uh, whose name was, of course, Semiramis. Uh, the famous hanging gardens of Semiramis is known in, in, uh, in the history. Now, Semiramis was the first deified queen of Babylon. You've heard the queen of heaven as the Catholics refer to, uh, to Jesus' mother Mary. And also there is the worship of the queen of heaven in Jeremiah chapter 7. It's depicted there. It's East, it's, it's Semiramis, it's Ishtar. She was later renamed Ishtar. It's not Virgin Mary that even millions of Catholics believe that they worship, they worship Virgin Mary. Not only Catholics, but also the in Eastern Orthodox churches, you, you you can find the worship of Mary not perhaps that much expressed as it is in the Catholic tradition, but nevertheless, it's still there; it's still present. But this, you know, Madonna and child theme, it's it originates from Babylon, and so again, Nimrod was so full of evil that it is said that he married his own mother, and also in this uh, Valentine's Day you can find it with his hearts and all those traditions, you can find this love between Nimrod and his mother Semiramis, which is horrendous. And uh, again, Semiramis, as I said, was the first deified queen of Babylon. She's also known variously by other names, because different people have different names for their, their deities. So she's also known variously as Dia, Diana, Aphrodita, Aphrodite, Aphrodita, Diana, Diana, Astarte, Rhea, and Venus. And her son was Tammuz, also called Bacchus, Adonis, and Osiris. Osiris in uh, Egyptian tradition, Bacchus in Greek tradition, and Adonis in the Roman tradition. You see, it is all one and the same pagan system. And the good question is, what does the, all of that have to do with Jesus Christ? Anyway, Tammuz was the supposed reincarnated Nimrod. He came back to life when the dead Yule log was cast into the fire and the evergreen tree appeared as the slain king deity reborn at the winter solstice. This is indeed uh, written in uh, Hislop's, Alexander Hislop's book, The Two Babylons, on page 98. How amazing is all of this? How amazing? It is so amazing and so shocking that I, I, I want to read it once again. So Tammuz, he was the supposed reincarnated Nimrod, he came back to life when the dead Yule log was cast into the fire and the evergreen tree appeared as the slain king deity reborn and the winter solstice. Now to those of you who live in the United, United Kingdom, uh, the book, or Alexander Hislop's book, The Two Babylons, was 
uh, rip was published again and for a long time it was out of print but it was published again back in 1999 hopefully you might still find it but if not it's there it is online you can download it print it out or read it in pd uh, pdf format it doesn't matter but you know it's it's there it's available and this man alexander hislop gives amazing info on the most popular so-called christian holidays Namely, Christmas and Easter. So, I think he was a Presbyterian preacher uh, of Scottish origin. So the Scottish people, you also have somebody to rely upon. You'll find so many interesting and good information in that book. So it's available. All that you have to do is just download it or buy it, or buy it and, and read it. But you see, what, 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 what we just quoted from... Uh, his book, The Two Babylons, and other books and other sources, you see the similarities with biblical elements found among pagan religions is not simply coincidence. Not at all. It is the design of Satan to sidetrack people into believing they're worshipping scripturally. When in fact, all that they're doing is completely non-scriptural, dear friends. And you see, according to legend, when Nimrod died, Semiramis, Nimrod's mother-wife, made the proclamation that Nimrod was not just a carnal human being, but was actually deity. And the account states that she saw a full-grown evergreen tree growing out of the roots of a dead stump. And this supposedly symbolized Nimrod reborn. Now you can see where, where does the Christmas tree uh, custom comes from. And on the anniversary of his rebirth which is the time of the winter solstice, December 25th, Semiramis proclaimed that Nimrod would visit the evergreen tree and leave gifts under it. So much about your Santa Claus. Imagine Santa Claus leaving gifts. No, it's not Santa Claus. Santa Claus is a, is a horrific figure from the Greek mythology who with his scythe is actually a, a, a killing, cutting little children. And so many times in when I'm here in Serbia, I've heard that little children would not go to Santa Claus. They would just scream and they would be so afraid. Well, no wonder. Because the children f feel, obviously, they feel that there is something spooky and horrible about that figure. That long-bearded, you know... Long bearded man with his ho 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 ho. And the largest, you see, religious cult which fostered the celebration of December 25th as a holiday throughout the Greco Roman world was pagan sun worship. It was Mithraism. You see, Mithraism penetrated into the Western world from East, from Persia. It just spread to Rome, first to Greece and then to Rome. And that became, you know, the most, the largest religious cult and the most celebrated cult. Which is, of course, promoted December 25th, the, uh, the, 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 the day when Mithra was born, when Mithra, sun god, was born. And the chief deity in this religion was the sun goddess, the oriental goddess of the heavens, called the queen of heaven. We come back, of course, to Semiramis again. So what is celebrated in the Catholic tradition as the queen of heaven is not really Semi, is not the, the mother of Jesus Christ, not at all. It is the pagan Semiramis, is the, uh, the, it is the originator of the pagan child sacrificing cult in ancient Babylon. It's Semiramis. And the season of the year when this goddess received her greatest adoration from the pagan world was at the time of the winter solstice in December. The winter festival was called the Nativity, but not Nativity of Jesus Christ. It was called the Nativity of the Sun. Now, there is another monumental work on ancient religion entitled The Golden Bough, written by Sir James Fraser. And this is what he relates in his book about all of this. This is uh, St. Martin's edition uh, of The Golden Bough, and it is on page 471 and four, 472. So this is what Sir James Fraser tells us. An instructive relic of the long struggle between Christianity and Mithraism is pre preserved in our festival of Christmas, 
which the church seems to have borrowed directly from its heathen rival. In the Julian calendar, the 25th December was regarded as the Nativity of the Sun. The ritual of the Nativity, as appears to have been celebrated in Syria and Egypt, was remarkable. The celebrants retired into certain inner shrines, from which at midnight they issued with a loud cry, The Virgin has brought forth, uh, and the light is waxing. The Egyptians even represented the newborn sun by the image of an infant. Now, mind you, this was before Christ. Image of an infant. What happens in today's Christmas celebration held by the Catholic Church? Well, all of their priests, they have the little manger and they have this little doll, supposedly Christ, which they kiss. That it was an image of an infant, you see. Well, we're speaking now about the ancient Egypt. So, they, they re, it is, it was, you know, reported that the ancient Egypt even represented the newborn son by the image of an infant, which on his birthday, the winter solstice, they brought forth and exhibited to his worshippers. End of the quote. From the Golden Bough by Sir James Fraser. Amazing. Now, what you may not know about Christmas carols. Christmas festivities, they start on the night of December 24th, when many in the West take to the outdoors in choruses, knocking on every door with a star-shaped lantern in respect of the Star of Bethlehem, singing Christmas carols and reciting verses to reenact Mary and Joseph's search for shelter. Well, you see, but the cust- you see, the custom of singing carols at Christmas is of English origin, according to Lucian of Samosata, who was the ancient Greek poet, writer, and historian, and he was writing, uh, he wrote a work on Saturnalia, and in addition to human sacrifice, Samosata mentions widespread intoxication, going from house to house while singing naked, rape, and other sexual license, and consuming human-shaped biscuits. Human-shaped biscuits, which are still produced in some English and most German bakeries during the Christmas season. Cannibalism, idolatry. What does all of this have to do with Jesus Christ? Not to mention the uh, blasphemous doctrine of the Catholic Church that the hostia, which they have, is literally becomes on their altars the body of Jesus Christ and the little cup of wine which they have literally becomes his blood. That has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And according to the Catholic Church, the uh, priests have the authority to uh, to turn that hostia, that piece of bread and, 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 and a little bit of wine into the literal body and literal blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, how, how, how can one religion get so far from the scripture? How about Santa Claus, as I call it, Satan Claus, Santa Claus is coming to town. Oh, really? Well, you see, there are various explanations that are being given to children about the ubiquity of Santa. But, you know, it is all a magical myth and nothing more. Because Santa is loosely based on Nicholas, a Greek monk, in what is today Myra, Turkey. He was born in Turkey around 270 AD. And there is also festivity uh, dedicated to him in my country, Serbia, on December 19th. And the, most of the Serbian families celebrate uh, him as their uh, uh, patron saint. In Serbia, Serbia is very specific uh, in that it is the only country in the world where various families have their patron saints. They celebrate those patron saints supposedly as a reminder of when they were converted from paganism to Christianity. So one of those Satan pa- Satan, uh, patron saints is uh, Saint Nicholas, uh, the most widespread and the most popular uh, 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 patron saint in the whole of Serbia. And it, he celebrated also in some parts of the Catholic world, I think, among the Croats, I would believe. But anyway, 
here is him, who is him? I mean, so, you know, the, the tradition of Santa Claus is based on that Nicholas. He was born in Turkey around 270 AD and he lived to become famous for his great acts of charity. He had a reputation for generosity and in various stories told of him, he is shown providing protection, food and gold to the needy. Now, you know, one story speaks of him as giving the most famous story, which is very famous here in East uh, and in my country, Serbia. Uh, it speaks of him as giving dowries to three young, pious, impoverished girls so that they could be wed and not go into other forms of lifestyle. Another speaks of him saving three wrongly prosecuted men from being put to death. Now, for these and other reasons, you know, after Nicholas died in December 6, 343, he was proclaimed a saint and the day became known as Saint Nicholas Day. But according again to some calendar shifts and others, he celebrated at least here in Serbia on December 19th. Now, of course, various cultures celebrated the day by instructing their children to leave out stockings or shoes the night before so that the saint could fill them with gifts. So he was thus considered the patron saint of children. So you see, where did the red-clad, white-bearded Santa we know today come from? Well... <laughs> You see, by the 16th century, Europeans, because St. Nicholas was in, uh, he was known as a patron saint in Europe, uh, Europeans were turning away from the idea of St. Nicholas, yet they loved the gifting tradition, of course. So St. Nicholas morphed into Father Christmas. In the U.S., St. Nick became Kris Kringle, and Father Christmas and Kris Kringle generally brought gifts on Christmas, not December 6th. And when Dutch settlers began immigrating to the U.S., they brought with them stories of St. Nicholas, whom they called Sinterklaas. And soon Sinterklaas became Americanized as Santa Claus. By the 20th century or so, all of the Father Christmases and Kring Kris Kringles became Santa Claus, uniformly depicted as a round-bellied, white-bearded old guy who brings gifts on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, you see. And then some so-called Christians from European countries where St. Nicholas was a beloved hero, they still celebrate St. Nicholas Day on December 6th by setting out shoes or hanging stockings the night before. Now, some claim it was German immigrants to America who took the tradition there in mid-18th century after some miraculous happenings involving Boniface, an English bishop who traveled to Germany to preach to pagan tribes and convert them to Christianity. So, what is, again, we're, we come now to the tradition of the Christmas tree. So, he said, Boniface is said to have come across a group of pagans about to sacrifice a young boy while worshipping an oak tree. In anger, and to stop the sacrifice, Boniface is said to have cut down the tree. And now, according to legend, at the first blow of the axe, a strong gust of wind instantly brought down the tree. The astounded Germans recognized that the hand of God in this event, uh, it, the hand of God was present in this event, and they humbly asked Boniface how they should celebrate Christmas. And he pointed out to a small fir tree that had miraculously remained upright and intact beside the debris and broken branches of the fallen oak. And of course, Boniface asked everyone to take home a fir tree. And here we come to that tradition again. So you see, the tree significance is still there, and the tree signifies peace, and as an evergreen, it also symbolizes immortality. With its top pointed upwards, it literally indicates heaven, the dwelling place of God. Now others claim that, you know, the first person to bring a Christmas tree into a house, in the way we know it today, may have been the 16th century, uh, no, no one else, no other than German preacher Martin Luther. Supposed reformer. Well, all that he did was he reformed just Roman Catholicism, nothing more than that. He never really returned to the scriptures. And the story is told that one night before Christmas, he was walking through the forest and looked up this to see the stars shining through the tree branches. It was so beautiful that he went home and told his children that it reminded him of Jesus, who left the stars of heaven to come to, to earth at Christmas. Here is another source, very relevant to all of you Americas and others in the Anglo-Saxon world and to all of us around the world. 
And it is the famous New York Times. The New York Times wrote an editorial against the practice of cutting trees and, and, and having them decorated uh, in the 1880s and when t- Teddy Roosevelt was the US president in the early ni- uh, 1090s, he railed against cutting down trees for Christmas saying it was a waste of good timber. Now again, December 25th was the birthday of the invincible Roman sun god Sol. Because of its known pagan origin, Christmas was indeed banned by the Puritans and its ob- observance was illegal in Massachusetts, U.S. between 1659 and 1681. So even the Puritans were aware of the origin of Christmas. How about you, modern residents of Massachusetts? Do you know about Christmas? You should. And at no point is a date for Jesus' birth given in the Bible. You should know that if you read the Bible. You know, Christmas in December is a Western Roman idea. That was the explanation from Dr. Matthew Nichols, senior lecturer in classics at the University of Reading in the United Kingdom. Now, for seven days from December 17th, it was party season in Roman times. Homes were decorated, parties held, and slaves became masters, at least for one banquet. (laughs) And it was the, you know, the start of a lengthy midwinter period of merrymaking and the season of goodwill called Saturnalia, a holiday that originated as a farmer's festival and commemorated the dedication of the temple of Saturn, the Roman god of agriculture and harvest. And by the time of Christian conversion, it was running into and incorporating a number of festivals, indeed. You know, cancelling Saturnalia was unthinkable. And so, so so-called Christian Rome converted that Saturnalia to a Christian holiday instead. And so, you know, so-called Christianity imported the Saturnalia festival, hoping to take the pagan masses in with it and so-called Christian leaders, succeeded in converting to Christianity large numbers of pagans by promising them that they could continue to celebrate Saturnalia as now as Christians. So basically they just adopted a pagan festival, a Roman pagan festival. And the problem was that, you know, there was nothing intrinsically Christian about Saturnalia. So to remedy this, the so-called Christian leaders named Saturnalia's concluding day, December 25th, as Jesus' birth. Well, you see, Christmas as we know it was kept long before Christ was born. It is a pagan holiday, Yule. Despite the Christian-sounding name, Christmas is a very ancient holiday that predates Christ. You know, it was 400 years after the death of Christ that Christmas, formerly the the Roman Saturnalia, and later called Yule, began to be widely kept. The pagan holiday Saturnalia that Christmas is based upon was a time of merriment, feasting, gift-giving, candles, decorating pine trees with ornaments and celebrating the winter solstice, birth of the sun. Now, the uh, European Europeans, of course, who else, would later, they later added their own flair to this midwinter holiday, even calling it midwinter blot, which means midwinter blood. Now, why would they call it that? Well, it's the human sacrifice and the December 25th winter solstice go hand in hand. William Sampson, in his work entitled A Book of Christmas, states that human sacrifice originated during the winter solstice. And here is uh, the quote from the book. Uh, The quote says, The giving of presents, particularly candles and dolls, called Sigilaria, also derives from the insistent origin of human sacrifice at this time of year. End of the quote. So you see, the gifts under the trees for the ancient pagans were their firstborn children, which they sacrificed to bring peace and to ensure the return of the sun. And indeed, archaeologists have found 6,000 chiles urns in Carthage alone, and the remains involved fire. You see, your precious child would have been the gift under the tree in old days. These children were sacrificed in a grove of evergreen trees. It satiated the sun god, therefore the sun would return again, and thus there would be peace and goodwill to all men. 
so the pagans thought. And this practice of sacrificing children under the green trees, evergreen trees, was a worldwide phenomena of old that was even practiced by the house of Israel, by the backsliding apostate house of Israel in the Bible. There are several instances mentioned in the Bible, but one of the best is in Isaiah, or Isaiah chapter 57 verse 5. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 5. Enflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valley under the clefts of the rocks. And you see the valley, it is speaking of here, is the valley of Ben Hinnom or Gehenna. And according to Biblical Archaeology Review, this particular place of child sacrifice was near some overhanging cliffs. And there was an idol called Molech was located there in that valley of Hinnom. So the Molech was located there, which was actually, what was Molech? Well, it was a molten idol with a cow's head at the top and a fire pit below. So the outstretched arms held the victim. There was a pulley system that slowly raised up arms to heaven and the child was dropped into the fire pit below. How terrible. Well, that's all associated with Christmas. And when people say, but what does it, you know, what does it matter? We celebrate, we don't celebrate paganism, we celebrate Christ. Well, it doesn't matter in God's sight because God knows what is all associated with that cult. You may think that you're celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, but you're not. You're celebrating the birth of the Son God because Jesus Christ was not born on December 25th. So therefore, you cannot celebrate His birthday. As we mentioned already, and I'll elaborate a bit more in the next audio message, He was born sometimes in September, October. That's it. Those are the facts. But yes, people love their tradition, they love their concussions, they love the uh, inclinations of their heart. Oh, it's a beautiful season. Oh, the, the festive spirit, you know. And Yes, there is a spirit, festival spirit indeed, when Christmas comes around. But just wonder and ask yourself, what kind of spirit is there? Not to mention about the shopping spree and materialism that, you know, comes comes up in the, in the Christmas celebration. So wonder and ask yourself what kind of spirit it is. So, I've just explained to you, Molech, there was a molten image with a cow's head at the top and a fire pit below. And the parents were sacrificing their firstborn children to the sun god through this Molech. It's horrible. And you see, the sacrificial altar where Molech was, Molech molten image was located, the sacrificial altar was located in a grove of evergreen trees. And this scripture that we read from Isaiah clearly depicts the act of child sacrifice. You see, most people would be appalled if they knew the origin of the tradition of gifts under evergreen trees. Because then, even as now, this winter solstice holiday was perceived as a time of great peace on earth. And Baal was supposedly satiated with these yearly sacrifices and all was well in the world. And another source, this will be uh, basically the last one. The Source Mythology of All Religions, Volume 5. Quote, Living infants and children were burned in the fire to the god Molech during this time. This was the time of the winter solstice, December 25th, when those heathen were dismayed at the signs of heaven. End of the quote. So why do people still follow these ancient pagan traditions that are connected to such evil? Well, think about it, you see. Think about it. What have reindeer elves, decorated fir trees, yule logs and Santa, Santa Claus, what all they do have to do with the Bible? Where do you find them in the Bible? They have nothing to do with the Bible. But they have everything to do with Yule. This ancient pagan holiday called Yule and its counterpart Christmas are one and the same holiday. Yule, December 25th, was based on the birth of the sun. And to Christianize this favorite of all pagan holidays, they changed it to birth of the sun, called it Christmas, and kept on keeping it just like they always had. Now, the question is, perhaps, how did the winter solstice became a 
Christian or so-called Christian holiday. Well, why the church later chose December 25th for Christians? Well, there are two main theories. They compete. One noted that in AD 2000, sorry, in AD 274, the Roman Emperor Aurelian inaugurated December 25th as the pagan birth of the unconquered sun. And Christians, Christians then borrowed the date and they also devised Christmas to compete with paganism. So you see, Christmas has its origin in several pagan holidays. The Roman celebration known as Saturnalia included the making and giving of small presents. This holiday was observed over a series of days, ending on December 25th, the birthday of Sol Invictus, which means actually the unconquered sun. Also, when the first missionaries began converting the Germanic peoples into Christianity, they found it easier to simply provide a Christian reinterpretation for popular feasts, such as Yule, and allow the celebrations themselves and the cele- you know, that those celebrations themselves to go on largely unchanged, rather than trying to suppress them, you see. That was a, we might say, a prudent politics at that time, but this is how all of this cult spread all over. So the presents the wise men brought to the to baby brought to uh, the baby Messiah they were brought to you know because they were com- coming before a king. The Bible never suggests that we should keep a Roman style Saturnalia where everyone gave gave gifts to each other. Jesus Christ was a Jew and he never kept Christmas in his life. He never mentions Christmas. Because if he did, if he kept it, we would have found it in the New Testament. Don't we find it anywhere in the New Testament? No, we don't. No, we don't. Uh, you know, the uh, Bible never suggests that we should keep a Roman-style Saturnalia and that we should exchange gifts. You know, Jesus Christ, again, was a Jew, never kept Christmas in his life. He never mentions Christmas. He did ask us to keep a memorial of his death which is the Passover, but never his birth. And also you may want to know that Halloween and Easter are theorized to have been likewise assimilated from northern European pagan festivals. So, dear friends, I've just presented to you the data published in the Anglo-Saxon sources. So Christmas, as we know it, was kept long before Christ was born, it is the pagan holiday Yule. And despite the Christian sounding name, Christmas is a very ancient holiday that predates Jesus Christ. It was 400 years after the death of Christ that Christmas, formerly the Roman Saturnalia and later called Yule, began to be widely kept.